Interesting how I initially chose the guitar as my instrument. Initially, I wanted to be a trumpet player, but my father said to me, uh, "Don't do that because you're going to really callous your lips, and all of the girls will not like that. So you want to be a guitar player, not a trumpet player." Um, so I went with my father's advice. Furthermore, my father wanted to be a guitarist himself, and. By doing so, he achieved it through me, his prodigy. And um, who did I listen to? I initially, I listened to Les Paul, and I listened uh, to Johnny Smith, guitar player, and Wes Montgomery. I listened to um, just so many players, and, and finally wound up listening to uh, Donald Byrd and Gigi Grice. John Coltrane, Youssef Latif, Roland Kirk, um, Don Ellis, the big bands, Gil Evans, many, many great uh, creative artists. When I first began playing, uh, the easiest way to describe the, uh, the experience was common to any child with his or her favorite toy. That's how I learned to play, with my toy. My toy happened to be a guitar. And I played with it with, with enjoyment to the maximum. And there was an alienation due to that that uh, overlapped into upcoming relationships with guitar teachers, primarily because their, uh, their intentions were closer to a curriculum than to a playful experience with a toy. To them, it wasn't a toy. To them, it was commitment to a serious instrument. And in my opinion, there's nothing more serious than enjoyment itself. So I, I had a, uh, a need to adhere to my or original commitment. My commitment was to enjoyment at all times. And that's what jazz did for me. It demanded improvisation, and that was a ticket into choice, personal choice, to uh, do things the way I wanted to do them, not based upon rules and regulations. For many years, I saw teachers as the guidance and the, uh, the controllers of rules and regulations, as opposed to freedom and imagination and ingenuity. I started very early in playing, um, along with some of my, my, my youngster neighbors, my, my close friends. I was immediately involved in music, in pop music. Um, for the summer, it would be myself and Bobby Rydell. At that time, it was Bobby Ritarelli, uh, his legal name. And I would stay with Bobby and his mom and dad, Jenny and Al. And, um, and my, my folks were working in tailor factories. So I had a place to stay with them, you know. So it was Bobby Rydell, it was Frankie Avalon, it was Ernie Evans, otherwise known as Chubby Checker. It was those years in, in South Philadelphia that uh, were prone to a very, very volatile, interactive stage of the evolution of a new music, which was rock and roll at that time. Dick Clark, the bandstand, was taking place. Um, many things were, were on go, and, and my dad, uh, during those years, 
at the age of 12 and 13 brought me to places that no longer exist. Back then it was Peps, the showboat in Philadelphia, in, in South Philadelphia. There was, um, of course, Steel Pier. At the age of 12, I met Les Paul and Mary Ford. At, my dad took me to see Les at uh, Steel Pier. And uh, Les, the first thing he did was he took his guitar off in his dressing room and he said, let me hear what you can do, you know. And I did, you know, and, and that was an introduction to a long-term friendship which lasted until his departure a few years ago. Uh, the same with Wes Montgomery. My dad brought me to see Wes Montgomery at Peps, and uh, I met Wes. He came over to the bar where mom and dad and, and, and I was sitting, and I became closely in touch with him until later on, um, in the early 60s, at the age of 15, I left Philadelphia and I went to New York City, to Harlem. And there I um, established a reputation. And I began to perform with Lloyd Price's big band. And Lloyd Price would only sing maybe, um, I would say, 25 to 30 minutes would be Lloyd's entrance on stage. But prior to that, the big band would play for close to an hour before Lloyd would even come out on stage. And in the big band at the age of 15, I was influenced by members of that band, such as Stanley Tarantine, Tommy Tarantine, uh, Julian Priester, Curtis Fuller, um, Jimmy Heath, uh, Charlie Persip was the drummer at that time. Um, there were so many incredible players, Red Holloway, um, just so many great players. And I played in Harlem and I was living in Harlem for quite some time. And there were two places in Harlem. One was Small's Paradise and the other was Count Basie's. Fifth and seventh was Small's Paradise, owned by Wilt Chamberlain, the basketball great. And right down the street at 133rd was Count Basie's. And at that time, I was uh, also living at in Mawa, New Jersey, at Les Paul's house. When I first came to New York, Les took care of me on the uh, the advice that my mom and dad. Uh, requested from Les if he would do that. So I would, I would uh, be at Les's house and I would drive one of his Cadillacs into, <laughs> at the age of 16, into New York City. And there was time to time that Les would come to see me at Small's Paradise. I was there with Willis Jackson, Gator Tail. And um, Les would come in. And one evening, uh, you bring back memories, one evening uh, I, I asked Les, I said, Les, did you ever hear Wes Montgomery? And Les said, no, I don't know. Who is that? And I said, great. I said, you know, right down the street at Count Basie's uh, is Wes Montgomery. And I want, you to, I want to introduce you to Wes. So I want to bring you down to Basie's on the, on the break in the set. And that's what I did. I, I brought him to Count Basie's. And... Uh, and he heard Wes Montgomery for the first time. And I stayed with them as they, they talked and we embraced. And then I had to rush back to Small's Paradise for the next set. We used to play seven sets a night with 20, 20 minutes off in, in between. So finally at 4 a.m. I, I was done my, my job. I packed my guitar and I left Small's and turned right toward 133rd. And the clubs were letting out because they all closed at 4 a.m. And standing outside Count Basie's was Les, Les Paul, Wes Montgomery, Grant Green, um, Kenny Burrell, 
and I made the fifth. No, and actually George Benson it wasn't Kenny. It was George Benson, and we wound over. We wound up having breakfast together. These were some of the influences and what brought about the earlier years, when I was 12 years old and met Les Paul, and uh, and Wes Montgomery, 13 years old, and how that overlapped into the future, which was then at that point a present, the present time, you know. And the same thing happened, uh, for instance, with a, a, a local guitar player who actually was a vocalist at that time, who used to come to Small's Paradise. And uh, after he would finish playing at one of the lounges on Route 46 in New Jersey, outside of New York City, you know. And he would come in, and, and we would hang out all night long, and he would, he would be there just stimulated by the music and the people. Well, that particular individual, I, a couple of years ago, I was performing at uh, the Blue Note in New York City. And uh, at the end of, of in a very, uh, like a volatile performance, I was covered with perspiration, with sweat, soaking wet. And it was a wonderful crowd, and it was very successful. I went upstairs to the dressing room, opened the door, and went in, closed the door, and went into the, the restroom and just refreshed myself with some fresh water and uh, changed, changed my shirt. And I came out of the, the restroom, and uh, there was standing Joe Pesci, the actor, and his manager, Tommy DeVito. And... Uh, and I said, oh, wow, Joe Pesci, wow, you were, I didn't know you were here. And he said, there's a lot of things you don't know. He said, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, of course I do. You know, all of the movies you've been in, some of my favorites. And he said, no, you don't remember me. He said, uh, I remember what you used to drink at Small's Paradise. And I said, really? I said, no, I don't remember any of that. And he, and he told me what I used to drink. The moment he said that, there was an explosion of memory that took place, and I remembered this young guitar player uh, from who was playing on Route 46, singing in a lounge group, which was Joe Pesci. Uh, so there were many things that took place way, way back then that uh, came to pass, that when you say who, was, who influenced you, uh, have a great deal to do with those influences. But in a sense, they were not influence. They were not as influential musically as they were realistically as human beings, as other people that really uh, did not fulfill the stimulation that I would have been seeking if I sought for it in music. experienced uh, a bit of the of, of the rock generation, the rock years. I remember um, with a guitar and a, and a record being played through a loudspeaker, and I was coming down a ladder from a helicopter in a schoolyard, in, in a high school, at a high school dance in the summertime. My manager was Jerry Blavitt at that time. <laughs> you know, I remember when I was uh, at Small's Paradise, that Will Chamberlain uh, asked me if, for a guitar lesson one night. And he came to my hotel. At that time, I was living at the President Hotel on 48th between Broadway and 8th. And he came to my hotel one night, and uh, it was amazing that he even got in through the door, his height, his, his size. And he sat on the edge of my bed, and I put my guitar in his hands. And, of course, I knew what the result was going to be. And I immediately said, no, you, you can't. You can't play guitar because your hands are too big. The, the fingerboard, it, it's not your size. It's out of proportion. You're out of proportion. <laughs> so many things like that really were significant experiences for me uh, living, living wise, not uh, on the basis of the craft of music. at that 
that time when I when I entered their roster, um, there was a great deal of support that were coming from that particular establishment, if only due to the fact that they they found it um, worthy and interesting to invest in that marketplace, which was jazz for the first time. But they did so in, in a very ingenious way. They hired a number of us who had the aesthetic aura that others who were more pop oriented didn't. Their interest in marketing at, during that era was sales, as it always has been. But to give it credibility, to open um, a jazz market, they hired myself and they hired Alice Coltrane and a few others. But they really put all of their, their investment in George Benson, in, um, in other groups of that nature, and, and they formulated and invented a new movement in jazz. And it was referred to as smooth jazz. And that's what started it. And on the other side was fusion music. And that was, uh, that was the credibility, that was the margin of credibility that brought around uh, interest in, in various um, pockets, you know. So, yeah. And not only that, then, then the exposure to new forms of music. A great pianist that, um, that, I, that worked with me and we interacted together at that time, his name was Ron Thomas. And of course, Ron is still with us and still prolific as a composer. Ron had an interest in jazz, and it was very new to him at that particular time because he was in, deeply involved uh, in 20th century music, composition. Uh, in fact, he was an avant-garde composer to some degree. And he was in charge of Karl Heinz Stockhausen's music at that time here in the United States. So Ron had an interest and he had a, an appetite and a hunger for certain uh, elements and he wanted to touch, he wanted to experience it. So too did I. So I brought Ron into New York City and to performance uh, alongside with Richard Davis and Curtis Fuller and others. And Ron in turn did the same for me. Ron brought me to meet Elliot Carter and to meet uh, other composers of that caliber, caliber you know, um, Milton Babbitt and others, George Crumb. So there, there was a, uh, a, a mutual um, interface of, uh, of enjoyment and interest in such things. And I think that some of those um, influences had a great deal to do with directions that were taking place, innovative directions, in fusion music at that time. So, yeah, that, that did come about. questionable since birth. I was born with um, AVM, arterial venous malformation, which is an entanglement of, of certain arteries at any given part of your brain. Um, a cerebral neurosurgery was eventually um, a necessity. What took place since birth were seizures as the, as the as the knot began to increase and expand until finally in 1979 it reached its climax and uh, that particular seizure took place in uh, California in Los Angeles and I was given two hours to live. They wanted to do neurosurgery at that moment but it, I found it necessary 
uh, to improvise and to fly back toward the East Coast. And I contacted uh, my parents, who were still alive at the time, and I told them what was happening, and they set up everything to go uh, with a big fan of mine, at that, to be honest with you, um, Dr. Simeon, Frederick Simeon. And I flew into Philadelphia, and straight from the airport, I was driven to Pennsylvania Hospital. And the operation, there were two operations. One took place on Good Friday, and I went into a coma for the next day. And the second operation took place successfully on Easter Sunday. And they removed 70% of the left temporal lobe, cerebral, of, of my brain. And uh, yeah, that was a volatile moment in my life. A very, po very positive one, to be honest with you. It's a funny thing, you know. Um, all of us, in one way or another, um, experience transformations in our lives that cause us to re reorganize our priorities. And along with that reorganization of priority in itself, we forget at the time that we, uh, we are propelled into commitment to do so, we forget about those who are used to the way we were. And those who are expectant of a repetition of what they know best. And they expect us to adhere to the rules and regulations of being understood. They understand us like that. And now that there's been a change, they no longer understand us. And they're waiting for us to go back to that, because that's what they understand. Well, that's what took place. Everyone understood me as a guitarist. Everyone understood me as a son, a nephew, a friend. And all of those things were erased suddenly. I had no memory of friendships. I had no idea of what a guitar was for. Uh, I had no idea of who my parents were. Um, all of those things just evaporated in the blink of an eye. Um, so here we are, you know, and, and I find that similarity is something that is a very powerful condition. And what I find most sim similar to that is the moment we have experienced something that was pleasurable and we remember that and it still is hovering in terms of our imagination I, our prioritized imagination. And then suddenly in comes an idea, and the moment that idea comes in, that priority evaporates, like, like the blink of an eye. It just evaporates. Suddenly it no longer exists. And what does exist is a new idea, a creative moment, where we're carried away on the wings of this ingenious uh, awakening. Well, that's what took place for me personally. And what evaporated was the past. And at the same time, since I had no idea what was going to take place next, what evaporated what was the very same thing that I used to consider a realistic definition of what is referred to as the future. The only thing that really existed and to this very day holds intact, is right now. That's the only thing that I can pay attention to that I know is real. The past doesn't exist, and I don't have no idea what the future is all about. So let me pay attention to the moment. Let me, let me focus upon reality, the only reality that there is. So that's what took place, and I think it was more difficult for everyone around me than it was for me personally. began to recover. It had nothing to do with music at that time. 
Um, it had everything to do with survival. And the guitar itself, it sat in the shadows of my reality during those moments. And I had no interest in it because I had no personal relationship with it from the past or the present. What I did experience in place of what used to be a very um, magnetic attachment is what the guitar used to be prior to the operations. It magnetized and it, it used to draw me to it, whether I liked it or not, something that I had to do all the time. I was addicted to it. Well, what replaced it was depression. In fact, depression to such a degree that it was very similar to Dante and the Inferno and Purgatorio came next. And um, it gradually moved in that order, you know, in terms of uh, transfer from one to the other. The guitar was the saving grace. It was, it was a utensil that was so um, attracting of attention as a machine in itself, a utensil that, that really demanded attention if you wanted to participate with its operation. It wasn't a toy. It was a very intricate machine that had some profound um, symbols that emerged from it at all times, such things as consonance and dissonance, ascent and descent, vertical and horizontal, um, major and minor. And all of those things that I've just described uh, basically have one thing in common, the opposites. Ascent was going upward. Descent was going downward. Sharps represented upward. Flats represented downward. Consonants uh, represented pleasure. Dissonance represented pain or distortion. I then began to really become deeply interested in polarity for the first time. And I saw that in all things as one. And the only way to retain that definition, it demanded uh, objectivity. And that's when things began to truly become realistic. And that's when the instrument unfolded once again to me. It no longer was a way to get away from the depression and the pain of it. It then became the instrument that uh, revealed a, a great deal of truth to me. So those were some of the things that I, that I think were profound in, in terms of their, their quantum uh, perspectives that go far beyond the craft at any level of craftsmanship. And that's something that is very difficult to, you know, uh, to project educationally when, when I participate uh, as a professor, an adjunct professor in uh, various different universities. It's very difficult because the normal curriculum is for the craft and not for what it, it, uh, it provokes. That's up to the individual. That's up to he or she who is provoked due to any circumstance that brings it about, you know. There was, from the very beginning, there was a margin, an aesthetic margin that was magical from the very beginning. And I think that that's the child. That's the child in all of us. And, you know, one of the things that I think is obtrusive is how education and social interaction educationally leads us away from that, that childish exploration of our own imaginations. We're, we're no longer prone to believe in something that is not listed as real. So we, we follow the list and we constantly attach ourselves to something 
that is merely an opinion. It's merely an opinion, no more than that. So when you say, you know, when it's said, when did you, when did you begin to use the 12-point star? When did you begin to consider sacred geometry? Uh, uh, when did you begin to um, agree uh, with Eckhart Tolle and others of that uh, movement? Uh, that began years and years ago as a child. When I went into a bookstore being on the road touring and I had nothing to do during the day and it would, it would be like that, I then w walked into a bookstore years ago in, in the early 60s and just browsing at random took out a nice thick book and opened it and behold, right before my eyes, opened the 64 hexagrams of the I Ching, the Book of Changes. And what did I see? I saw 64 little blocks of six lines divided in, in 64 different ways. And guess what? It dawned upon me, wow, that's the guitar strings. That's all of the combinations of sets of strings for notes that are going to be played. If the four lines on the bottom of the hexagram were full and the top two were broken, that meant that I would use the fourth, third, second, and first string for any chord that I wanted to play, and vice versa, if all of the lines were broken, that meant silence. If just the top two, uh, the sixth and the fifth were open, or were, were straight across, then that meant those were the, the two strings. And actually, to be honest with you, that's the guitar. That's the blueprint for the guitar. It's similar to what, if you were to go to a cardiologist's office, behind his or her desk, you would see the, the heart and all of its divisions. Well, here you, you, you're looking behind my desk at 64 hexagrams, no longer called the I Ching or yin and yang. Now they're called the guitar strings and how they are combined in every way they can be done. Ever were done on six strings, are being done, or ever will be done on six strings. These are the combinations of the string groups. Seeing something like that emerge from an ancient Eastern philosophy and seeing that as literally information on the structure of, that, of this machine caused me to wonder why teachers, guitar teachers, never taught that. But they didn't know that because in, in that case, uh, it was not the guitar. So I began to really be interested in other manifestations of similarities that are based upon the two opposites. In the case of the hexagrams that I just briefly described, the opposites in that case are broken or full. So here you have another set of opposites, the same as consonants and dissonance. So, you know, there's the similarities that bring a very holistic um, logic into activity for an individual. You begin to see a similarity, opposite, 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 man, woman, day, night, major, minor, birth, death, good, bad, uh, poor, rich. Of course, there are all of the, the phases in between. But when you come down to it, that's all there is. There's the AC, DC, heads and tails. I think that the most significant and definitive quality of change that took place would be these two things. Prior to the operation, let's consider the operation the nexus, the central point of change. And let's look before, the, before that was active and before that came about. My interest 
prior to the confrontation was competition, was competitive, was achievement in terms of what, uh, you know, in some, in some terms is referred to with words like turf, uh, to be the strongest in your field of endeavor, you know, to have a reputation, to have the notches on your, the, the, the handle of your pistol. You know, my pistol was a guitar. And to have notches on it were, were, were similar to how many albums have you ever done? Who have you played with? What record label are you signed to? Do you have an endorsement? These are notches on the handle of your gun. And that's what my interest was, and that's what brought these things about. Uh, that is something I considered success. All of that, um, it dissipated and it, it broke into pieces like glass, broken glass, suddenly. And then after that, there was an emptiness. When it began to, when I began to reemerge from the other side of that nexus, history already had taken place. There was a history that had all of those notches still intact, that had all of those achievements, all of those recordings. That history was in books. So I no longer had to give any uh, attention to achieving it. It was something that was waiting for me to take advantage of it, which I had no interest in that in itself. Um, and that's what that's what took place afterward. Now I, you know, from I'm of course I'm 70 years old at this point, but I feel like the child that I was prior to this lesson. My life has been a lesson, and I have the one thing that I began with as a child: ingenuity. And I and I treasure that from the bottom of my heart. It's my favorite toy to be ingenious at every step is to me is 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 worth anything that you will have to contribute to achieve that that opportunity to feel that to experience that the guitar it, it's a tool you know and I remember when, when I was addicted to it, at this point in my life, it, it's sim this, is, this utensil is similar to the knives and forks that I use when I have dinner, or the spoon that I stir my coffee with in the morning. And why is it similar? Because it's of service to me. I no longer really am shackled to it. I remember a time, here's a great example, I remember a time when I was there, addicted to the instrument, and mom would come into the little room that I would be in and say, Pat, put that down uh, and go to the corner and get a carton of milk. And what that caused, what that injected into my consciousness was repulsion. I didn't want to hear that. What I was doing was more important than what she distracted me from doing would be why she distracted me. Until I began to uh, consider the use of other tools. For the first time, I began to see that the alphabet was a tool. I never realized it that way before. But when I finally did, I took a scale, a major scale, and a minor scale, and even modes in time, and I would place them under the 26 letters, these programs of tones. And then suddenly, from the alphabet, the street name became a melody. A license plate became a melody with the, the numbers and the letters. And suddenly, uh, music expanded as a universal language as opposed to an addiction to similar to pads on the sides of a horse, you know. 
an idiom such as jazz, such as rock, such as country or classical, or any of the things that we become uh, entrapped into. So then it became obvious to me that that was the lesson, and that's what this was meant to do. Now it's, it's similar, as I said to you, this tool is similar to any other tool. It serves its purpose, and it's of service to me for whatever I need it to do for me. As far as, as, far as teaching, you know, the, there is no such thing as a teacher, like there is no such thing as a student. Either of them are one and the same. The student is the teacher sometimes, and the, and, the, and the teacher is a student at the same time. So I, I, don't, I no longer see the education on the basis of its, its structure. I do find its structure extremely difficult to freely function within in a fluidic way because the curriculums are so concrete that they demand respect and they demand attention. Well, you know, in, in, that, in the light of that, there are methods, social methods, um, that are a necessity to interact with grace and compassion in the midst of these things so that there is no, there can be no abrasive um, uh, conditions that are done to the, the current uh, situation, you know? But I think most of all that, that it's their intentions. What do you want to do with this power? You've come to learn about this power. Why? Do you, do you want to make money with it? That's fine. You know. Do you want to uh, create a reputation with it? That's fine. Whatever it is, is perfect. You'll learn from whatever path you take. I find it very confining and difficult to, um, to relate to labels on music. Music is a universal language. I, I find it very difficult to call music jazz or to call music country, to call music rock, to call music uh, blues. Jazz is a way of thinking. It's a way of, of writing. It's a way of, uh, it's a way of tasting. And, you know, you have, a, you have a plate of food, and instead of going around in a circle from one to one, you're improvising, and you're, at moment's notice, your, your ingenuity is moving you. you know? Life is consciousness, and it's universal. So I find that difficult to allow uh, a universality to be compressed, that's like calling you a Toyota, if that's what you drive. That's not what you are. You're the driver. It serves you. It takes you where you need to be and what you need to do. That's your vehicle, and that's not you. Well, the same thing with, with the labels of music. Jazz is not what I am. You know, although I do see that word jazz similar to the word improvisation. And improvisation is a state of courage. It's something that uh, someone is going to use in any direction they choose to use it. Not only in music, but in all, every field of endeavor. That's an exceptional uh, symbol. things uh, are in the in the motion are in the in the process 
Um, I've completed a series of approximately 15 compositions for guitar and orchestra that I'm looking forward to, for, for this to come about. It will do so in its own time when there's enough financial support to be able to, to, to bring that project into uh, real time. Also, there are a number of things that were committed to um, a few years ago that are beginning to come to fruition. And one of them is a motion picture on my life story that um, is being done out of, uh, from not only Hollywood, but also from Paris and from, uh, in Italy, Milan. The producers are coming from these different points. So contracts were signed a good three years ago, close to five years, to be honest. And they're raising uh, what's needed for the projects to continue to the next stage. Really, really a pleasure to involve myself with J.W. Pepper. It's a, I had no idea that its roots went so far back with such significant achievement. It's a wonderful opportunity.